Good morning, Plum Supply dealers and managers. My name is Guy Lieberman. I'm the Director of Digital Marketing with Man Marketing. Unfortunately, I couldn't be with you in person this morning due to the weather conditions, but we wanted to make you this video so we could still share with you the program that we had planned. We wanted to talk to you today about proven strategies for lead generation. And for HVAC dealers, lead generation is everything. So before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about Man Marketing. We're a full service advertising agency and production house. We're located in suburban Chicago in Carroll Stream, Illinois. We've been in business for almost 40 years. And in addition to what we're talking about today with uh, digital marketing, we have a full suite of video production, audio production, media buying, everything that you can think of an ad agency would provide. Our partner, Brad Oxenkyle with o and Advertising would also have been there with you today, and Frank DiMatteo, our senior account executive. So I'm going to be doing the show this morning, but welcome and thank you very much for the time we've given you. Let's get started. So let's get started and review our agenda for today. We're going to talk about advertising priorities for lead generation because the things we need to do for lead generation are different than some of the other advertising that we do. We're going to talk about local listings. We're going to talk about paid search, Facebook advertising, Pandora, very important, video and display ads, talk a little bit about your website, and we're also going to talk about managed chat. So when we're talking about digital marketing, the most popular websites in the world, which ones would you think of? I don't think they're too difficult to identify. It's Google, Facebook and YouTube. This is where we're going to spend a lot of our time, both in what we talk about today and the advertising that we do. It revolves around search, it revolves around social, and video, as well as audio streaming services like Pandora. So in terms of those most popular websites, what's most important when we're talking about lead generation and digital marketing? Well, number one are the results. You're trying to achieve the result of getting either a phone call or an email inquiry so you can provide the service that you provide to customers. But what about the time invested? I can only afford to invest so much time in trying to achieve these results. And how much money do I have to spend in order to do it? These are all questions that we really need to answer for ourselves and we have to balance them. I can only afford to spend so much money in my budget and that money that I spend has to produce a certain number of leads to get the business that I need. We can really advertise in two different ways or put our advertising in two different categories. We have what I refer to as push versus pull advertising. So let me describe the differences between what push and pull is and it'll probably make a little bit more sense. Push advertising. Push advertising is when I'm trying to find customers, okay? And if I buy an ad in the newspaper, I pay a certain amount of money and the newspaper publishes a certain number of newspapers. That's what I'm paying for, regardless of how many phone calls I get or how many email inquiries I get from somebody going to my website. If I buy a TV ad, I get a certain number of ads and that programming is viewed by a certain number of consumers. So I'm pushing my message out to consumers. Okay, this can be a very effective way of reaching a large audience if we're able to identify the people that we want to reach and getting our message across to them. Reaching a lot of people in a short period of time can be highly effective. Now, let's talk about the other kind, pull advertising. Pull advertising is me creating a presence in a place where I'm waiting for the customers to come to me. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? So, what am I going to do? I'm going to create spaces where people search for the things that I provide. Things like Google Ads, things like my Facebook page, places where people are going to find me when they're ready. That's really the key. It's on demand. So pull advertising and push advertising. They're not mutually exclusive. In fact, they actually work together. So with pull advertising, we reach the most people in the market with what we offer on their terms when they're ready to do it. There are, free, there are both free and low cost options for this. 
And the most attractive thing for advertisers is it's action-oriented. In other words, we usually pay only when an action takes place, like when we do paid search on Google and an ad is clicked on. We pay when the ad's clicked on, not when we show the ad. Make sense? Now that we've identified the differences between push and pull advertising, let's talk about some priorities for lead generation. And there truly are priorities. We need to kind of work from the inside out. So the first priority would be your website. Because no matter what kind of advertising we do, eventually everybody ends up on our website. Whether they come through search, social media, or respond directly because they've seen or heard one of our other advertisements. The website is the most important piece of real estate that you have outside of your physical business and your physical tools and facility. So without our website and without a good foundation there, we're really going to have a hard time making the advertising we do effective. So we're going to talk a little bit about our website. Then let's look at what that next layer is. What's that next priority? Well, local listings, business listings like Google and other listings, these are the places that allow people to find out who we are and where we are. And they're associated with our website. Let's look at the next layer. If people are going to search for us, there's organic search and then there's paid search. Paid search is an important component and we want to make sure that we're there and available when our customers are looking for us. What about social media? That would be the next layer, Facebook. I think Facebook is a terrific medium to be able to reach people partly because both the number of people we can reach and the targeting we can use to do it. Beyond that, there are other audience targeting mediums, both in video, in audio, and digital display. And we're going to talk about those as well. So all of those kind of build a picture of the priorities that we want to work from and do it from the inside out, as I said. Let's move on. So between all those priorities, what is our focus going to be? How do we break that down? All of these things are important. We want to try and incorporate as many of them as possible. We're going to break them up into the two different groups. So our focus from a poll standpoint is going to be our local business listings, paid search through Google, our website, and then another element we can incorporate into our website, live chat. But we'll talk more about that later. On the push side, our priorities are going to be Facebook and the audiences we can target there, Pandora, which is one of the most popular streaming audio mediums around, and then YouTube for video as well as digital display advertising. With our focus set and our priorities set, let's go ahead and get started. Local listings. Local listings consist of all the places on the internet where your business is listed. Now the first most important listing you have is your Google business listing. It's called a GMB, Google My Business. So I'll, I'll just refer to it as the GMB from now on. Your GMB is your next most important piece of real estate compared to your website. In fact, some businesses' GMBs actually receive more traffic than the website themselves. Now why is that? Because oftentimes what people are looking for is just certain pieces of information. They may have visited your website before and now they just need a phone number. Or maybe they need directions. Your GMB provides a whole bunch of information like that. It can give them a link to your website, it can give them the phone number, your hours of operation, services, photos, a whole host of information. And you know what the best part about it is? It's free. So let's go in depth a little bit more about our Google My Business listing or your GMB. It's found both on Google Search and on Google Maps which is very important because almost half of Google search is in the map category. So when we talk about our GMB, we really need to understand all the different pieces that are there. So first of all, when do people see my GMB? When does it come up? Think about it this way. People do different types of searches. If somebody searches for my business by name, then my GMB is going to come up. And we've got reporting information that tells us how often that happens, how often people look for our business by name. There's also people that look for the services that we provide but don't necessarily know us by name or are looking at multiple providers of the service that we have. So they might be looking for HVAC dealers. And if they do a search like that 
and we're geographically close to them because Google knows where we live. If we're using a mobile device in particular, it's got information that tells them how far away we might be from that business. And our listing may come up under those searches. And we know how often that happens as well. The third kind is going to be if somebody looks for a competitor that provides the same type of service that we do. Believe it or not, your ads can come up, your GMB can come up when people search for your competitor, especially if it's a geographically desirable competitor, somebody else in your neighborhood that provides similar services to you. The value of the GMB can't be overstated. So some of the information they provide you, you get to see the actions that are taken. You'll see how many people visit your website. You'll be able to see how many people click on a phone number to call. They'll also know things like if they look for hours or directions. All this information is available when you log in and look at the back end of your GMB information. It's a little dashboard that gives you this. The most important thing is that your information is both complete and accurate. It's very important that Google knows the exact name, address, and phone number of your business, spelled exactly the same way everywhere. And we'll talk about everywhere more in just a second. But there's a place for you to see this information in the back of your GMB. Make sure, as I said, name, address, and phone number are all included, and all of them need to be consistent. Check your hours of operation. Make sure those are up to date. If you have emergency hours or holiday hours, you can update those as well. Photos, video, these are other great places that can be added. One of the other things to try and do with your GMB is we want to do an update to it with some kind of frequency. If you can update some piece of information on there monthly, Google will reward you with having your listing come up more frequently. So I'm going to show you a way that I think you can maybe accomplish that. One of those ways are with reviews. Now, we all know that reviews today carry even more importance than they used to. Why? Because they're everywhere. Our reviews are on Google and all kinds of other sites. But I would tell you that the reviews on Google are probably going to carry the most weight. And if you think about it, it's because that's where people will come in contact with us most frequently. So not only having good reviews, but making sure we both solicit for reviews with every customer that we do work for, and then also respond to those reviews. So anytime a review is responded to, you, uh, a review is responded to, that would be considered an update to your Google My Business listing. So make sure and keep track of reviews that people leave and respond to them. Another key when responding is whether it's a good review or a bad review, we should respond to both. If it's a good review, hey, thanks, really appreciate it. It doesn't have to be a lot. You can keep it brief. The key is if somebody has some kind of a bad experience and gives us a negative review, whether it's warranted or not, don't engage online. I'm sorry that you had a bad experience. Here's my name. Here's my number. Please contact me directly, and I would be happy to try and address your concerns. That way, other consumers would see this, and no matter what somebody said in their bad review, you at least have the opportunity to show that, one, you responded, you did it on a timely basis, and you were willing to try and make things right. And that's the most you can hope for. Anytime we engage online, it has the opportunity to really turn into something worse than just the review itself. So let's stay away from that whenever we can. Here's a new feature, or a relatively new feature on Google that everybody can benefit from. It's called a post. Now what a post is, it's really a free ad. And it's on the bottom of our Google My Business listing. Now this ad can be a display ad of a certain size, and then that ad can link anywhere you want it to. So obviously we'd probably want to link this to our website in most cases, and have it be some kind of an offer, a call to action whether it's a seasonal offer or something that you're just offering for a short period of time. These ads or posts only appear on Google for a limited period of time. Google keeps them live for about seven days and then you can repost that same ad again. What they don't want is Google doesn't want to see old information that stays out there for too long. So let's make sure and try and update these as often as possible. So we've talked an awful lot now about your GMB, your Google My Business listing, but there are lots and lots of other listings out there on the internet. Now Google's the most important one, but 
we also have to take into consideration that your business is listed typically in 70 or 80 other sites around the internet. Now, you might say, Guy, if everybody goes to Google, what's the importance of all these other listings? Well, I'll tell you. They're important for several reasons. First of all, there are more places that people actually go than just Google. Secondly, Google needs these other business listings. Google is looking for the information that confirms that your business is this website that we think it is. So it's kind of a confirmation of who you are and that your business is the one associated with this address and this website. In technical terms, they refer to it as the NAP. Remember I said before, name, address, and phone number? That's the NAP. We have to make sure our name, our address, and our phone number are consistent across all these sites on the internet. The way to do this, even though most of these listings are free, you can't manage 70 or 80 listings, even if they're free, individually. Lots of loose information comes up on the internet, and it's not always correct. It's kind of like weeding your garden. You pull the weeds today, it doesn't mean they're not going to come back. These are called duplicate listings and duplicate listings can ruin the search engine optimization or local SEO, the ability for Google to identify our business and find us locally. So, we have a solution called Power Listings. Power Listings allows us to do what we really want, which is manage all of these listings in one place through one venue. So, with one click, we can make sure that all of your name and address and phone number information, as well as offers and hours and those other things, can all appear in the same manner as they do on your Google My Business listing. So, Power Listings is a way to tie that together with your Google My Business listing so that Google and the consumers know who you are on the internet. Let's move on to our next topic, paid search. Now, Paid search means paid advertising on Google. And for those of you who might not be completely familiar, there's actually two different types of ads on Google. There's what's called organic listings and then paid listings. Both of them appear on the same page, but the paid listings are generally at the top of the page and at the bottom of the page, while the organic listings are in the middle. Both come up on desktop and on mobile. Now, I'm talking about mobile quite often, partly because, if you weren't aware, 50% of all the internet traffic and all the search that people do are on mobile devices. So we need to make sure that any of the advertising that we do is both mobile friendly, as well as making sure that we give them the best opportunity to contact us using their mobile device. Because you can't call from a desktop computer, but you can call from your phone. So, with the different types of ads that we have, let's talk about how paid search works. Now, many of you might already be doing paid search, but for those of you who aren't as familiar, we start with a budget. How much money do we have to advertise with? And then we're going to determine what we want our targeting to be. And by targeting, I mean both the geography that we advertise to, because we can do this either by zip code, or with a radius, or a combination of these things. And then, we're gonna create a list of what are called keywords. Keywords are, the used, are used by the consumer when they search for our products or services. So we want to make sure that the keywords that we're advertising for trigger our ads when we want to put our ad in front of people. So the next part of it is we have to actually create the ads themselves, the text, the ad copy that goes along with them. And as I said before, with paid search, we only pay for the clicks. So, no matter how many times our ads show, we only pay when we get somebody to click on our ad and take an action. So, let's talk a little bit more about what a campaign and what ads can look like. There are different types of campaigns. The ones that you're going to be most familiar with are what are called text campaigns. If I do a search on Google, the ads that I see are completely text. You don't see video, you don't see images. These text campaigns will include multiple elements. They can include a description line, a headline, or two headlines, and they can also include what are called extensions. Extensions can be different pieces of information that can be links to your website, or just informative pieces of information, including a phone number, where somebody can click directly on to call you if they're doing it from a mobile device. 
Now, one of the extensions that might not be talked about as often but can be very important is your location extension. The location extension is the address and location information of your business. Now, you might say, well, I'm not in a business where I necessarily want people to come to me. I generally go to them. That may be true, but think about this. When people do a search for a local business, a bricks and mortar business, what we're really talking about is trying to identify businesses that are local to me. And that means a location extension can trigger those kind of searches. So if people are looking for a business in a particular area, we need to make sure that our location helps trigger those ads. Now, we talked about Google Maps before. And remember I said about half of the traffic that Google gets goes to Maps? Well, you may not know this, but if you don't have a location extension on your paid Google ad, your ads will never appear on Google Maps search. So you're eliminating half of the traffic if you don't have your location extension enabled. Now, you're not in the business of providing paid search. This is what we do and companies like ours. What you want to make sure is that you've got a paid professional that's managing these campaigns for you that should know the kind of information that I'm speaking to you about now. So text campaigns should always have a location extension in order for you to appear both in Google Search and in Google Maps. So if I want somebody to contact me from Google Maps, I can include both a direction to my business, if it's appropriate, or just what's called click to call. It's actually an icon that's attached to my phone number so somebody can contact my business directly. There's also another form of campaign that some businesses are interested in that are call-only campaigns. In other words, they can't visit the website, I don't offer directions to my business, the only thing they can do when they trigger the ad is to call. This could be very effective, especially when you're talking about a company that provides 24-7 emergency services. Hmm, that's a business that I think we all are familiar with, right? So call-only campaigns, you would only pay when somebody clicks on an ad to call you. These are just some of the types of considerations that you need to give to a paid search campaign. But I would have to tell you, when we're trying to get people to contact us, having our advertising present when they do a search on Google is one of the most effective way we can get them either to call us directly or come to our website, learn more about our business before contacting us. Either way, paid search is a key to having great success when it comes to lead generation. So let's talk a little bit about social media, Facebook in particular. So why Facebook? Well, first of all, it's one of the most visited sites out there. So the number of people we reach is most important. Engagement, how much time people spend on Facebook, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And then our targeting capability, because no matter what we do, we want to be able to make sure that we reach the audience that we think is most likely to be interested in our products and services. So before we get started, I want to make sure that everybody understands the difference between your Facebook page and your Facebook news feed. Now, personally, I have a Facebook page, and Man Marketing as a business has a Facebook page. But what I'm talking to you about right now isn't primarily about your page. I'm not necessarily trying to get as many people to my page as possible. There are businesses and there are particular business channels that that makes a lot more sense. Where we're really focusing on Facebook is using their targeting capabilities so we can place ads into people's news feed. The news feed is what we scroll through when we're on our phone. All those pictures, those stories, those images from our friends, from our family, and businesses that would like to do business with us. So it's our capability of targeting the news feed that we're really talking about primarily today. So why Facebook? Again, the demographics. It doesn't matter really what business you're in, whether you're trying to reach men, women, young, old, income, whether they live rurally or whether they live in cities, it almost doesn't matter. There's such a high percentage of every demographic on Facebook that any business can benefit from trying to reach their audience here. Now, given that, here's a statistic that you're going to be wowed by, or maybe you won't, but the average consumer spends almost an hour a day on Facebook, 58 minutes, and that's just the average. 
So there are some users that spend very little time, and there's a lot of people that spend a whole lot more time. So think of our phone as our own personal computer or our personal TV channel, and Facebook is one of the channels that everybody likes to watch more than anything else. When you think about it that way, you'd want to advertise there too, wouldn't you? So when it comes to advertising on Facebook, there, like with Google, is both paid advertising and organic advertising. We're focused on the paid advertising. The paid advertising is going to take much the same kind of format. We have the choice of doing posts that incorporate both pictures or video, and then we get to choose when somebody interacts with our ad what we want them to do. So we're going to talk about what those choices are and which ones might be best for you. As far as how the process works, it works pretty much the same way as what we talked about with Google, except after we establish a budget and after we establish our targeting, then we want to establish the audience or the behavior of people that we're looking for. See, the difference between Google and advertising on Facebook is everything we do on Google is keyed to what people type in. But on Facebook, people aren't typing in things that they're searching for. But I will tell you this, Facebook knows everything about what we do while we're inside of Facebook, what pages we like to look at, what our interests are, what we engage with, and Facebook also has information about what we do when we're not on Facebook. So if we have an account and we're logged into Facebook, but I leave and I go do searches on Google and other websites, that information Facebook has as well. This is how Facebook is going to know if I might be interested in the product or the service that we're offering. So in addition to our geo-targeting, we're also looking for specific behaviors or interests based on other websites and searches that people will have done both inside Facebook and outside Facebook. Now let's talk about the ad types. So once we establish the audience and we establish who we want to try and reach with our ads, we have different opportunities both with our ad type and our ad targeting. So in this case, let's talk about homeowners because those are the ones we want to reach for this particular, uh, this particular search that somebody might be doing. Let's focus on the length of residence too. So not just a homeowner and not just a homeowner that has been in their home for a short period of time, but somebody who's been in their home for a longer period of time. That would indicate the home is older and probably in need of services. We can also look for specific behaviors. HVAC pages and, and sites that people will have visited. So those options are available to us. We could also choose other things that don't necessarily have to do with the behavior inside of Facebook. There's something we can do called retargeting with Facebook. Now what do I mean by retargeting? I can have people that have visited my website and many of them leave without contacting us. In fact, about 95% of the people that visit our website leave without contacting us but I could choose to show them ads on Facebook after they leave our website. I know this can sound a little bit confusing, It just means that I've got multiple options and multiple ways that I can reach people inside of Facebook. We can also employ something called a custom audience. A custom audience can consist of people that you've already done business with in the past. We can upload that information and we can identify people's Facebook accounts who match the information that we have on them as customers. We can target them and we can also target what's called look-alike audiences. In other words, other people that are similar to the ones that we've already done business with. All of these are options that should be explored using a paid professional like myself or somebody else that does advertising for 
paid search, and things like Facebook advertising. Have somebody help you through this. It's not something that you want to try and do on your own. In terms of the ad types that we have, as I said, we can use many different ad forms. We can use a display ad. We can use video. We can also use multiple display ads. Either way, whether we use any of these formats, what happens after somebody clicks on the ad, though, we can also control. So one of the popular things to do is to have somebody click on an ad and have them visit our website. And that's great. They get to see our products, our services, and they can contact us directly. But we're talking about lead generation today. So one of the things that we can do on Facebook that's very unique is a lead generation specific ad type. So if somebody clicks on one of our ads, we can have that go directly to a form that's pre-populated with the customer's name, email address, and phone number if it's included in their Facebook account. We can have that form submitted directly to us and then still give the customer the opportunity to visit our website. Facebook lead generation ads have proven to be a very successful format specifically for businesses that are dependent upon lead generation. Have a strong call to action. Make an offer and give somebody the ability to take advantage of it by contacting you directly. It's all part of what you get when you advertise on paid Facebook advertising. Okay, so our next topic is Pandora. Now, Pandora is a word that you might or might not be familiar with, but what it is is streaming audio. But before we talk about Pandora specifically, when we talked about Facebook a moment ago, you heard me talk a lot about audience targeting. These are now the mediums where we get to choose and we pick the people that we want to show our ads to. You know, things have come a long way since we had to run TV ads or radio campaigns that reach everybody that might be listening to the station, but we don't necessarily know that the people listening or watching the station are the ones that we'd like to reach. Pandora, Facebook, and many of these other mediums are just that. They allow for audience targeting, and that's why it's so important. Instead of paying to show or have my ad played for everyone, I get to have my ad paid for or played for just the people that I believe could be interested in what it is that I'm trying to sell for a product or for a service. Pandora is what's called a streaming audio service. Now, audio we think of as radio. And when we listen to the radio in the car, we might be button pushers. We don't want to listen to all those commercials. And we're just going to hop from one to another to another looking for that song or for that news radio station that we might be wanting to listen to or that sporting event. What Pandora lets us do is Pandora lets us target people regardless of the content that they might be wanting to listen to because we could be targeting with other behavioral and demographic information. Let me show you what we're talking about. So first of all, understand that one in two people listen to streaming media or streaming audio on a weekly basis. That means half of the people that we'd like to reach are in the medium that we're talking about. So why is Pandora a good choice? Aren't there a lot of other streaming media services out there? There are. So let's talk about that for a moment. Pandora is the leader. They are what you'd call the 900-pound gorilla in this space. There are two kinds of streaming media services. There are paid and there's unpaid or organic. As you can imagine, if you're paying for the streaming media, that is often without commercials. The organic or the free version of these streaming sources, Pandora offers both. But I would tell you that almost over 90%, well over 90% of people listen to the free version of Pandora. In fact, of all the streaming media sources out there, Pandora accounts for one in three people that listen to streaming media. So that's one in three Americans listening to Pandora. Sounds like a good place to advertise, don't you think? So, what makes Pandora or streaming audio so unique? You know, if I do a search, I'm not doing anything else while I'm typing. If I'm watching a TV show or watching a video, I'm not doing anything else. But audio is one of those things that we can do passively. I can listen to music or I can listen to any kind of audio broadcast while I'm doing something else. In fact, that's the way most people usually listen to audio content, which is why people spend so much time and so many hours per day actually doing that. 
You can do it while you're working out, cleaning house, while you're cooking, in the car. People listen to streaming audio while they're at the office or at work. So listening to streaming audio is something that we generally do while we're doing something else. So it allows people to both focus on what they're doing as well getting input from the kind of message that we'd like to give them. So this is unique compared to some of the other mediums that we have. Now, if we're going to present ourselves in streaming audio, why would I want to choose, say, Pandora versus any of these other choices? Well, just to give you an idea, the commercial breaks on Pandora are so minimal that they're less than five minutes per hour. Now, when you compare that to traditional radio, those button pushers in the car, that's 13 to 17 minutes. When we watch TV, those ads we're seeing are generally anywhere from 11 to 20 minutes for an hour. So the reason people do use the free version of Pandora is because the frequency of ads is so minimal that it doesn't really feel like it's intruding on your listening experience. You can enjoy the content that you want, and the occasional ad hardly even bothers you at all. That's why people tend to stick on the channels and listen for as long as they do. One of the great advantages of Pandora is that people spend as much time as they do on it each week. So, who can we target with Pandora? Because remember, I said this is an audience targeting medium. Well, first of all, we can use a zip code list, so you only would reach the people in the geographic area that's desirable for you. Once again, we can target homeowners. We can target them by their length of residence. We can also target by the age of the home, say 1990 and older. So all of these can be used in reaching just the people that we want. Because if I'm providing a particular service and it's all geared towards homeowners, I want to make sure that I only reach those homeowners and people that have a home that's of an age that is likely to need the service that I provide. So when we're talking about Pandora, the combination of audience targeting, the time that they spend listening to Pandora, and the fact that I can do it in a very cost-effective manner make Pandora very desirable. I'll give you just a couple of examples because we do work with hundreds of HVAC dealers. Sharon's Heating and Air Conditioning ran a campaign on Pandora, spent $2,000 and got 89 visitors to their website because I didn't mention it, but in addition to the audio component of Pandora, there's also a display component. So whether somebody's watching on their computer or on their mobile device, you have the opportunity to click right into that ad and take you to the website for the company that's doing the advertisement. So in addition to getting their audio message there, they had 89 visitors to the site for that $2,000 investment. Very cost effective, very good reach, Pandora is a highly effective way to reach the customers that are interested in what it is that we're trying to offer. So let's continue our discussion about audience targeting. We already talked about Pandora as a terrific medium for reaching people with audio advertising. Now let's talk about video and display. Video and display are both very powerful mediums as well. And the most powerful video medium is YouTube. YouTube, also owned by Google, is actually the number one place to reach that key demographic of 25 to 54 year olds. You actually reach more 25 to 54 year olds today on YouTube than you do through traditional TV advertising. That's a big threshold to cross. Now, advertising on YouTube is a little bit different, but it's also the same way that TV works in terms of the ads that we run have to be a certain length of time. 15 seconds or 30 second commercials. Now, the advantage with YouTube is, first of all, we only pay for the ads when they're clicked on or when somebody watches the ad in its entirety. When was the last time your cable operator gave you that opportunity when you advertised with them? So, one of the things that we want to do is have a compelling commercial for 15 or for 30 seconds, and then what we do is we key that to keywords that people search for on YouTube in a similar way that we do with Google Paid Search. Now this is a very new type of ad that YouTube has available called TrueView for Action Ads. The reason it's unique is because it's both keyed to search, so when somebody's searching for things on Google, it actually triggers the ad on YouTube. So if somebody would be searching for HVAC dealers on Google, 
the next time they came in contact with video content, they would be eligible to see one of our ads that we would have trigger for that. So these ads carry two components. The video that we talked about that's either 15 or 30 seconds long, and these ads are skippable. Now if somebody chooses to skip the ad, we don't pay for it. They only pay, again, when they see it in its entirety or when it's clicked on. And that click, of course, would take them to your website. But there's a second component involved in these True View for Action ads. There's a banner that runs along the bottom of the video. And that banner will stay on site even after your ad stops playing. So the whole reason I went to YouTube was to see some other video content and video pre-roll as it's called is the ad that I see before the content that I want to watch. So after I watch the ad, even if the ad disappears, my banner promoting my company with my offer and the ability to click through to my website remains on screen for as long as the content does that the consumer is there to watch. Very powerful combination of both video and the duration of the ad that we get to keep and it's keyed to searches that people do on Google. So if we decide we want to reach people on Google and we know that's a good thing, everybody's not going to click on our ads, but I can use that search to trigger ads on YouTube via my video channel. So remember that video isn't just about what people are doing when they're within YouTube. We can have that triggered by a Google search and then there are many places where the YouTube video player appears. So oftentimes you're watching a video that's being provided by YouTube even if you're watching it on another website. But YouTube is, after all, the second most visited website on the internet. In fact, it's one of the most visited websites in terms of the length of time that people are on there. I said Facebook was number one, well YouTube is number two. So the time that people spend on YouTube means that there's a lot of opportunity for them to see our ads. Let's talk about display advertising for just a second. Everything that I just told you about YouTube for video is also true for digital display. Those same keyword searches can trigger display ads that appear on all kinds of websites where people go and do the search for the products and services that they normally go and look for. So when we talk about being able to trigger ads on YouTube with keyword searches, we can do exactly the same thing with display ads. And our audience targeting is the same. So if you want to advertise with video, you can do it. If you want to advertise with display or advertise with both, all of them can be triggered by keyword searches on Google. This is something that can really help energize your advertising campaign when you can specifically target people based on the searches that they do. So we've spent all of our time up to this point talking about all the different ways that we can drive traffic to our website. Now let's talk about our website itself. So we could talk for an entire day about any one of these topics, in particular your website. But what I want to give you right now is a checklist. A checklist of some key things that we really need to look at and make sure are in good working order. I'm going to give you what I call deal breakers and then some additional priorities. So, First of all, let's talk about the deal breakers. Remember I said that more than half of the traffic today is done on mobile devices for the internet? We absolutely need to make sure that our website is not only what's called mobile friendly, but it needs to be a mobile first design, or, or what we call fully responsive. So if a website looks good on a mobile device, it'll look just fine on the desktop. But every website that looks good on a desktop doesn't necessarily look fine on a mobile device. So we need to make sure that our website is built for specifically and optimized for mobile, and then Google will reward us for that. Google will also penalize us if our website is not mobile friendly. So you can actually drop in the rankings if your website is maybe a few years older and not necessarily built to the current standard today. So mobile first, an absolute must. Additionally, security. We all know about the security of data and the things that we hear in the news today. There's something very simple but very important that every website today needs. It's called an SSL certificate. An SSL certificate is what is the difference between what's called a secure website and a non-secure website. Now, 
Secure websites previously used to be limited to things like credit applications or the input of credit card information. But today, Google wants all websites to be secure, so they want to make sure that every website has this SSL certificate. You'll be able to tell if your website does because it starts at the very beginning, before the dub dub dub, with HTTP and the letter S before a colon and a backslash and a backslash. If your website just says HTTP without the S, it's not secure. It's not expensive, don't worry about it. For less than $100 a year, you can get a certificate and it comes with an annual renewal that you do have to pay. But your website provider, if they aren't doing this for you now, can provide this for you. I would highly encourage you to check out your own website and let's make sure that they're secure. So, other tech stuff, nuts and bolts I like to call them. Things that are on the back end of your website, metadata. These are words and phrases that tell Google what your website's all about. Things like what the title of the page is or headings on the page. These are all things that your website provider should be in charge of and not necessarily you in particular. But they're important to do because if your pages aren't tagged properly with these meta tags as they're called, Google can't correctly identify your pages and consequently you don't get as much traffic to your website as possible. It's also important that your website has what's called a site map. This is a directory. It's the organization of the folders that make up your website. The other thing that's very important is speed because speed has everything to do with a mobile device as well. If your website doesn't load quickly in a certain period of time, people are going to leave and go to somebody else's site. Every day our tolerance becomes less and less for websites that don't perform in a quick manner and provide us the information we want. Don't let your site be one of those. Now, let's talk about a couple of other things that I wouldn't put in the category of deal breakers, but they are things that we want to pay attention to. So, adding fresh content. With some kind of regularity, we need to change something on our website because Google will re-rank our website when we make changes to it, and that's important. Easy thing to do that with is an offer, whether it's monthly or whether it's seasonal. That can be an easy way to update and add content to your site. Another way is with tips. If you have a blog, adding a tip a month or every couple of weeks is an easy way to do that. You can also provide a newsletter and give people the ability to subscribe or be able to receive your offers via email. Any one of those are ways that can update the content on your website without too much difficulty, but you do need to have a plan for it. That's everything that we want to do as it relates to the website technically. Now let's talk a little bit more about how we can capture more of the people that visit our website. So we've brought all these people to your website. What can we do to capture more of the people to get them to contact us? Now we want them to call, we want them to email, but you know what? There's one more thing that we can do. We can get them to chat with us. So let's talk about managed chat. Chat is a component that lets people interact and contact us without necessarily having to give up their personal information. So this is kind of a halfway step because ultimately we need people to give us their phone number, we need their personal contact information, but we can use chat as a way to let them begin to engage with us before they have to give up that personal information, which is often a barrier to people contacting or emailing us. So how does it work? So if I'm on your website, there would be what we call a bug down in the corner, and that bug would, at some point in time, pop up and become a chat window, or somebody could click on it and engage with it manually. Now, what happens when this chat window opens? Well, we're talking about managed chat. So managed chat means that it's not your business or people at your business that are managing it. We actually have a service where people on the other end of these chat windows are going to engage with the customer to be able to answer their questions, leading them to wanting to either make a phone call, connect with you now, or submit an inquiry so that we can contact you back. Another nice feature about chat is Chat can be operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even when you're not necessarily open or after hours. So managed chat is certainly a solution that can provide you not only more leads, in fact, 
Websites with chat can receive up to 30 or 40 percent more leads than just a phone call or a form submission on their website alone. Everybody wants to create more leads. We've spent the money that we've spent on our advertising to get people to our website. Now we want more people to engage and capitalize with us. So what about the people that might not want to engage with chat? Well, I'll tell you, there are a lot of places that chats actually use that you might not necessarily think about. So within Facebook, there's something called Instant Messenger. And Instant Messenger is actually used by people instead of text or along with some of the other applications that they use. So it's becoming very familiar to a lot of people. In fact, a lot of people would prefer to engage with a chat versus a form or calling you. So the fact that we can offer that as an option going in can be very beneficial. Now, if someone's on your website and they're about to leave, we can actually call what's called a last chance icon. And that means that even if they don't click on it, the window can pop up in their website, giving them an offer to say, hey, before you leave, wouldn't you like to know about the savings that we can provide you or this special offer that we can introduce to you right now? This can also increase the number of chats and the number of leads that you'll get from your website. So how are we going to use this? Well, we can do several things with it. First of all, it works on mobile devices as well as desktop. And here's one of the best parts. We only pay for the leads that we get. Now, I've talked about that with paid search. I'm talking about it here again. It's nice when we can just pay for the action. So if nobody engages with the chat, you wouldn't have a bill for that chat this month. Every time somebody does submit a chat request, if it's outside of our market area, you wouldn't pay for that. Or if for some reason the chat request is for a service that we don't provide, you wouldn't pay for that either. So a pay per lead managed chat solution where I only pay for verifiable leads in my area for the services that I provide is a pretty good way to go. And if I can increase the number of leads that I get and I can get them at a time where I might not necessarily be available to answer the phone or respond to an email message, that's even better. You can also include a component for text. And if bilingual is a need and Spanish language is an important part of your business, we have options where you can get just chat in English or chat in both English and Spanish. They have bilingual operators managed by real people that make real responses to these inquiries. I would encourage all of you to make chat part of your website. No matter how long you've been in business, you will get more leads with a managed chat. I encourage everyone to take advantage of it. Thank you all for your attention today. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about lead generation and the opportunity that it presents. So for everybody that's attending your conference, I've created two very special offers, but you have to sign up for them today. So there's two ways you can do this. The first is you can go to our website and I've created a special page for you. The website is Man Marketing, that's M-A-N with one N, marketing, manmarketing.com forward slash plum supply. So if you go to that page, there's a form. You can complete the form and we'll contact you. And you can let us know which one of the offers you want to take advantage of. The two offers that we're putting out there today, one is related to the business listings, the power listings that I spoke of, and the second one is related to the chat opportunity we just talked about. We have special pricing and special offers for anybody who's attending the show if you choose to sign up with us today. If you don't want to go to the website, all you have to do is email us. You can send us an email either to Frank DiMatteo, let me spell that for you, I'll leave it on site for a minute or on screen, but it's F-D-I-M-A-T-T-E-O at manmarketing.com. The second email you can send to is to our partner at o, o Advertising, Brad Oxenkyle. His email address is a little bit easier. It's brad, B-R-A-D, at O-O-A-D-V dot com. Again, thank you very much for allowing me to share this with you today, and good luck with your opportunities in the future.